Greetings pet lovers, Bridget here with First Street Pets and today we're going to talk about what you didn't know about the history of dog food. Dogs have lived alongside humankind since our earliest days on earth. There is evidence going back as far as 15,000 years showing that dogs lived alongside people as their companions. Some of this evidence includes being buried in the same graves with their human family, with adornments on their skeletons like necklaces and other items showing that they were a beloved part of the family. Some of these remains of the ancient dogs were analyzed by researchers who found that these dogs had been fed a diet of wheat and other grains and vegetables in addition to animal proteins, which tells us that these dogs were fed by people because if they had been hunting and scavenging on their own, their diet most likely would have been 100% meat. This trend of sharing the family meals with dogs continued largely unchanged for thousands of years. One of the first written accounts of a dog's recommended diet is in a book called Res Rustica. You'll have to excuse me, I don't know how to pronounce Latin, which means farm topics. A Roman named Marcus Terentius Vero says, the food of dogs is more like that of man than that of sheep. They eat scraps of meat and bones, not grass and leaves. You should also feed them barley bread, but not without soaking it in milk. They are also fed on bone soup and even broken bones as well. This book was written in 37 BCE, and it goes into great detail on the care of dogs and many other animals domesticated at the time. Similar diets can be found in records across the generations, advising a diet of some combination of meats, milk, grains, and bread products. Often the meats were things less desirable to people, such as organs, fat, and bones. Unless dog owners were well-to-do, these meals were typically made up of leftovers. Frenchman Nicolas Boyard wrote in 1844 that dogs should be fed what is left at the bottom of the stew pot. So none of these references speak of a specific recipe for dog food. They just advise about the foods that people eat that should be shared with dogs. It wasn't until 1860 that there was even a concept of something called dog food. Ohio electrician James Spratt was in London plying his trade and apparently looking for other business opportunities when he noticed sailors on the docks tossing their hardtack biscuits to eager begging dogs, and this gave him an idea. After returning home, he created a product for dogs that was similar to the sailor's hardtack. It was palatable, dried, and it would last a long time. He called it the patented meat fibrine dog cake, although it consisted mostly of grains and beetroot with the meat source remaining a mystery. Spratt's business with the dog cakes was very successful. He marketed this product to higher income people who could afford to buy a product specifically for dogs rather than just feeding their dog leftovers. He specifically marketed it to the American Kennel Club and to the owners of those dogs that were participating in dog shows at the time. Spratt placed an ad on the cover of the January 1889 AKC Journal and obtained testimonials from members like William J. Dunbar, who stated that his winning greyhound named Royal Mary was almost entirely trained for all of her last year's engagements upon them, them being the dog cakes. In 1907, American inventor Carlton Ellis, also credited with the creation of products like varnish and margarine, came up with the now iconic bone shape for dog cookies. In the tradition of feeding dogs waste products from human food, Ellis was at the time working on something to do with waste products from a dairy, the excess milk that they had that was not wanted. He found a way to create a cake similar to Spratt's, 
but also mixing it with milk as one of the main ingredients. According to legend, he made the finished product, offered it to his own dog, who refused to eat it, and he then got an idea to make it into the bone shape, which was something that dogs were used to eating. And when he presented it to this dog in this manner, the dog gobbled it up. Whether or not this is true, we don't know. But in any case, that is now the iconic shape of most dog cookies that we buy today. Ellis's new cookie was a big hit with dog owners, and it was soon mass produced by the national biscuit company, Nabisco. I never knew that Nabisco stood for National Biscuit Company, and now you do too. Under the name, you guessed it, Milk Bones. As you may know, during World War I, countless horses were used in the war effort, whether transporting soldiers, supplies, pulling cannons, doing every kind of work imaginable. And sadly, after the war, these horses were all unwanted. Many were lucky enough to go on to other jobs and other owners, but the majority of them were sent to the nearest slaughterhouse. If you've seen the movie War Horse, this dramatizes the story of one of those horses who survived the war and was lucky enough to be reunited with his owner. But unfortunately, most were not so lucky. New York businessman Philip Chappelle supplied over 100,000 horses to the military at the time. And after the war, he got to thinking about what could be done with all this excess horse flesh. While some people eat horse meat around the world, it's not common and it's rarely done in the United States. In 1922, Chappelle found a solution by purchasing an old packing plant and setting up a canned dog food business. He called it kennel ration, a play on words of K ration, which was the soldier's food. This venture was so successful that they soon ran out of a local supply of horses. That's kind of a horrifying thought. This soon led to the decimation of the American Mustang, now known to most people, thanks to the efforts of activists who are active today, but also the original activists like Velma Braun Johnson, also known as Wild Horse Annie. At the time, these free-roaming horses were rounded up and slaughtered en masse. They had no owners. Ranchers didn't want them on their land. So it was a free source of meat for this canned dog food. These despicable practices continued until the Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act was passed in 1971, which afforded them some protection, which they still have today to some degree. As a kid, I spent a lot of time in the library. I've always loved reading and researching. I was one kid, even as a teenager, where if I said I was at the library, I actually was. Now, I really enjoyed some of these old black and white books that showed me another world, another generation. Not only the old black and white pictures and the clothes and hairstyles of the people at the time, but how differently the dog breeds looked, which will be a subject for another article and video, but also how people fed their pets. And typically in the dog breed books or dog care books, there would be recipes recommended by the author of what they fed their dog. And this was, as always, some combination of cereals, meats, breads, and milk or broth, bones, things like that. So these books were written in the 40s and 50s. So even though dog food did exist, it was still not in common usage at that time. Few people alive today will remember World War II, but you may have heard the stories from your parents or grandparents and other ancestors about the many aspects of wartime, including rationing. My own grandmother saved every bit of bacon fat in a can that she kept in the refrigerator and every piece of foil that we used was folded up and saved to use another day. We didn't throw a lot of stuff away. She also hoarded sugar and jam packets from restaurants because who would pass up free food? <laughs> One of the materials most needed during wartime was metal. So the canned dog food fell out of favor because a lot of metal was being used and discarded and considered wasted that was needed for the war effort. So there was a need for a production of another kind of food that could be packaged in a bag or a box that didn't require metal. General Mills and Ralston Purina 
producers of cereals and food products for livestock animals saw a new market in the production of dog food. Ever wonder why you open a bag of Purina dog food and it kind of smells like cereal? <laughs> because it was made and still is using waste products from human food production. That's right, what we now know as kibble, what everybody feeds their dog, was originally made by machines designed to produce cereal and basically packaged in the same boxes, which you will still see today in stores. By 1956, Dog Chow was one of the leading brands. In the 60s and 70s, this extrusion technology and these methods of mass producing kibble dog food really took off. In 1958, a group of pet food industry lobbyists calling themselves the Pet Food Institute launched a campaign to promote commercial pet food as the only option. And as you can see, they were quite successful. Virtually everyone today feeds their dog dog food and would insist without knowing why that the nutrition is superior to anything that humans have fed their dogs for the last 15,000 years. I hope you found this video interesting. I need to do some more research to do another article and video on the history of cat food. Originally, I was going to do them both together, but it turns out that cat food has a totally separate story, which is just as interesting. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. What are your opinions on dog food? What do you feed your dog? Did you know anything about the history? I hope you've enjoyed this video and you'll subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.